that was uh, quite uh, intriguing that we have found that there is a relationship between the way the animals learn a new behavior and the way they perform when you remove the reward, in this case it is the, the platform in a, in a more different place, when you remove the platform, you remove the reward and the animals behave in a very intriguing way, consisting of uh, the animals who uh, learn better the acquisition phase of a morris for the maze. They take shorter time in looking for the platform in the position they learn it was. Or if you prefer just to take a, a, a broader uh, comprehension, is uh, on the contrary, the animals who learn worse the acquisition phase insist longer time and this is uh, it's just a correlation that for us is very interesting because it is related to correlation is in close relationship with the number of humans, the number of new humans. What we have seen is that the higher the number of immature of humans in the above examples of these animals, the higher the number of these cells, uh, the, the higher the number. Uh, the animals learn words and existed longer times in the day for the platform for the animals. Because the shorter is a number, the shorter is a number that is counted into the animal. The less the animals acquire the information and take shorter time in looking for the platform which where it was. So they need time for looking for the platform in other places. So there is no good or bad behavior. It's just that the behavior of the animal, when the animal is removed from, uh, you remove the uh, reward, depends on the pets. This is a close correlation, a significant correlation with the number of people. This is just a correlation, I know, but uh, uh, this is quite interesting for us, enough to uh, leave in some uh, new experiments that we have. So a second research project is about the inheritance of epigenetically in thousand behaviors. What we are doing is uh, doing interventions with both positive and negative effects uh, uh, able to alter hippocampus dependent behaviors. And we are uh, trying to, to know if these alter behaviors can be inherited, comparing control versus interview leaders, and also comparing broader meters of the same parents both before and after the intervention. And finally, the research project number three that this was I, I will be doing today is about the neuroplasticity uh, related and non-related <coughs> neurogenesis. So uh, roughly in the in the last years we have been uh, what the work about the effects of the environmental factors, for example, the which environment and environmental which and physical exercise, and some of the models like for example depression models, aging and degeneration and how the effects of these uh, factors is uh, mediated through uh, growth factors, the DNA, the GFMs, and others. Many of them are outside the brain, are, are, are in the blood, and enter the brain crossing the blood brain barrier and mediate the effects of these factors in neurogenesis, neuroplasticity, and obviously functional behavior, learning, and memory. So today we have our focus uh, in the last years in ETR data. Because DTF beta is very well known, uh, uh, pathway, uh, the, the signaling pathway uh, that has uh, as, uh, SMAT2 as one of the uh, transmission factors that are uh, mediating the, 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 the effects of DTF beta when it's uh, bind, binded in the bone to the canonical uh, receptor, and uh, phosphorylates SMAT2, SMAT2 oligomerized with uh, SMAT4, so on, and then uh, translocates the nucleus and mediates the effects of. Modulating transcription factors, coagulators, and coagulators. So, with this uh, idea, our aims was uh, to uh, study the function in the use of these transcription uh, factors, particularly the SMAT2, and both in early analysis and in human analysis. And not easy to know what is the influence that this is and use of this transcription factor 2, which may be to DNA. So for the first set of experiments, for the first thing we did uh, we did is to know that the expression pattern was not too well in the entire views. And the first thing we saw is that the uh the vast majority of different lining units in the dynamics are 
is suspected always that when you have silence in Spain or especially in and Spain, in the society, they come to the results sometimes. So it's not like that. So this is like that. But it's certainly unique in this case, we have our own office, essentially that. So the own expression is like two uh, uh, experiments demonstrate that the, the, the animals have an increase in phosphorus from three positive cells and also a decrease in the DNA cell survival. And this is how they get as well the mature granule. Remember that the most of the granule neurons are exposed in this mature. So what is the, the, the well, this is a, we have a, a lot of experiments, uh, a lot of different parameters that, that as we can discuss later. But about the mature granule neurons itself, so what about the complexity of the lipid tree? What we saw is that the Silence, uh, silence in SMAT2 will obtain a decrease, a significant decrease at some specific distance from the soma uh, of the uh, complexity of the lipid tree, together with a uh, decrease in the length of the dendrites and also a decrease in the spine density. And what about the other stories in the experiment? So, in the experiment, we obtain also a decrease in the complexity, but at a completely different distance. Than in the science experiment, this is quite different for us, and also, but not unfortunately, not significant increase in uh, both the spine density and then this uh, layer of dendrites that is the contrary, or would be the contrary, but we are not significant. Probably, I thought that's uh, probably due to another different number of animals. This experiment is kind of more, um, more or less between uh, 10 or 12 animals. Why those places in my experiments have uh, six, uh, seven, eight animals? So, probably uh, not uh, enough to get uh, a bit of significant result. But the, the, the point is that the trend is uh, to, to be on the contrary. The contrary okay, and well, many other parameters, the same as before, and we can discuss later. And what about the behavior? Because uh, we have a, a, a good infection. Um, in, the, in the vast majority of the of the infection, so as this infection is very good and uh, um, could be influencing the behavior. So what uh, Simona did it was a uh, um, um, measuring the activity, the anxiety in the elderly part plus maze and the learning and memory in a typical uh, multiple maze plus multiples and what. She uh, found is that the activity is now significantly different as the anxiety of the classmates, but the animals with uh, silence SMAP2 were performing worse computer controls at the end of the acquisition phase. And there is no significant results with the old expression. So uh, we have a, a lot of changes in neurogenesis, a lot of changes in natural learning models, and also in the so the next question, uh, well, this is, uh, so, so the next question for us was uh, uh, whether uh, uh, if uh, the usual protocol that we use in the lab to modify the organisms may not be and species can be modulating also uh, this uh, SMAP2 that's this factor. And for that uh, purpose, we uh, made a uh, very simple experiment that. Uh, Making the the animals doing a training of exercise during two weeks, but with a moderated speed and only for uh, 40 minutes. Because in our hands, in many others, 40 minutes of moderated speed travel is completely enough, absolutely enough to get the typically reported positive and uh, physical effects of exercise. And cyanotic effects, um, uh, sometimes provocative effects, and but this is exactly before that the uh, blood levels of corticosteroid awareness. So it's before in, uh, getting the animals stressed. So in this uh, model, we analyze with a microarray of 24 typical uh, transmission factors that are uh, compared uh, between uh, selectively aligned animals for uh, DNA methylation. And what we found is that in the animals that the transmission factors that are colored are the the four that are uh, with a linear change in DNA methylation. In this case, in our hands, the equal methylation that is in the control of sedentary animals is reduced dramatically to increase theoretically the uh, expression. So, the next thing we need is a quantitative uh, 
easier with uh, to measure the ammonia levels. And certainly, these four factors are uh, modulated to an increase in the ammonia expression. And the biggest change was spatula. So this is the change after uh, the animals run uh, for 40 minutes uh, a day and ammonia <coughs> speed. So increase the expression of the SMA2 together uh, after uh, together with the uh, uh, decrease in the uh, DNA activation of the hormone. So the next question for the first set of experiments was, okay, so is uh, able, is uh, exercise able to modulate the same that is related in animals, these uh, changes with science in all those experiments? So we may have seen that uh, proposal with the same uh, antiviruses, but this time with animals doing exercise, the same short uh, battery of the of testing and the sacrifice and the first, uh, the first set of uh, results is our neurogenesis. They do uh, probably uh, remember that uh, our proliferation of the science in this country we have, uh, we have a, a, a minor decrease in the, uh, in the decrease in the proliferation of survival. We have here no significant results, although the event is the same, but the first important for us is that there is no uh, changes in so here we have an increase in survival that is reversed with the exercise. And about the complexity uh, of the tree in the animals, again, the same that is the tree animals, this time with the wild animals, we have an increase in the complexity of the tree. Again, we have a decrease in the uh, in length of the animals and a significant decrease in the Stain density. So we have, we have again uh, a decrease in the uh, complexity in the all species animals, but an uh, increase in the dendritic stem. So again, we found exactly conflict of the population of animals and the uh, sign density. And what about the baby? Okay, the same behavior of testing. So, what we found is that the exercise is able to repair the worst performance of the, the animals without the fat too. I mean, and we look at that as the worst performance in the, at the end of the acquisition phase. And the exercise is able to repair that. So, no significant results in the water maze in the other species in animals. And to finish, we uh, try to know more about how the fitness. And for that uh, goal, that goal, we analyze the legal, the executory, and individual signaling in the uh, typical uh, region that is more usual to measure this. And this is the inner portion of the molecular layer together with the uh, upper portion of the uh, granule cell. Because this, this is the main influence of life, the main influence of the uh, performance actions uh, from the internal cortex. <clears throat> so we measured the here and to our, uh, we found that while we did do the excitatory signaling, there is no, uh, there is no changes, we found absolutely no risk again in the selection of the animals with silence in the small too. Uh, that is reversed again uh, after exercise, and that these animals do the exercise but with a bit of expressing uh, humans, not to as an input. Again, the control is that we get to the short and human condition. So, so we draw this uh, result in uh, the mind. Uh, I hope to uh, convince you that the SMAT2 is a very relevant um, uh, transmission factor uh, in, the, in the middle of the and that the science in our expression has a clear effect on implementation of the viral officers, but also in the benefit. So, a degree in SMA2, the main degree in a body section, and a degree in SMA2 creates one degree in a body section, and also a science in SMA2. And more important for us, the possible is that the science in SMA2 alters the acquisition phase of the most important phase, and it's an implied for the exercise to work. All this is important because probably um, this it seems uh, to us that the possibility that the uh, semantic uh, expression is modulated to a genetic mechanism after exercise makes a 
different pathways to control all the pathways, not only the ETF data binding to the data. Okay, so this is the so this is the group, and this is our collaborators in Barcelona, this is our, our funding, and this is a picture of Madrid that is uh, our little group, seeing that I sometimes hope that we can take it uh, to the media. Thanks for being here. Sorry? <laughs> what is it? Where is your Bible? Oh, in fact, it's the whole Yeah, the problem is that we have an expression of the SNAP2, but our infection, our infection of the LinkedIn virus, this is how we silence in our expression of the SNAP2 in the in the line of the line. So we can have conclusions about. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I told you that. No, they are, they are in fact, a lot of them are in the CIA. Yeah, in the news, also because in the news, uh, most of the very few cells that we uh, found infected uh, were in the news. There is not uh, Well, I, I, have, I have not seen that, but I think it's uh, long before the, the expression of SMAT2, and I think it's the same um, because, uh, because SMAT2 is in the early stages of development the structure. So what, what is uh, new for us is that all the natural neurons are also expressing that strong has a strong expression of the SMAT2 that we uh, as sincerely I have to confess that I expect that the majority of expression was in the system we have an expression that is more than the majority of the but the infection is not actually in this, this, this cell, so this is made exclusively of the identity. The and what's the, the first question? The first question. Oh, yeah. Any other questions? I was wondering, um, are there endogenous inhibitors in the system? Endogenous inhibitors of SMAP in the system of TGF vaccine? <laughs> uh, for, the, for the most part, it's the GFP, yeah. but, but what we are trying to demonstrate is that the, independently of the sign of the long term sign of the we can modulate the SMAT2 expression, for example, by physical exercise. So we try to know what is an molecular mechanism making that, but as you can guess, uh, our B is that it's inside. So, okay. so is exercise a good thing or bad thing? <laughs> uh, it's a very good question uh, because, because uh, contrary to that, what is uh, a new uh, unusual way to think of that in the, in the, in the nowadays, I think that uh, too much exercise is very bad. So I know that everyone now has the idea. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is how how many how much exercise is too much. So remember that when you exercise, you activate a lot of signal lead, uh, uh, that is very bad to your mitochondria. <laughs> because finally we are really because we uh, take oxygen. Oxygen is part of you. So, and this is literally it. So, um, if you live fast, <laughs> you will die fast. So, in fact, <laughs> and in fact, in fact, the best way to extend it, to, to enlarge your, your time period is calorie restriction, uh, to have a sedentary life, 
<laughs> but the point is that it is that like good. It's not the point, it's not the, it's the good. So if you are happy, if you are happy doing exercise, no matter if the exercise is too much or too it's, it's not much. So if you are happy, it's good for you. The problem is that the, I, in my opinion, with my minds, but with my opinion with the world with, uh, that we are doing now with human beings, is that the most of the people doing a lot of exercise are not happy. <laughs> and I, I honestly think that this is quite good for you. And, uh, and, and it, there, is, there are reasons for that. So you have an increased level of basal, they increase the basal levels of corticos, of corticos. This is quite good for them, good bad for you. Yeah. I recommend a very moderate exercise. So the recommendation uh, is not easy. Just a couple of very short questions. First, uh, SMAT2 modifies the density of uh, spine membranes. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. The spine and, density. And, and the spine density. And what about the spine, the size of the spines? So, uh, we have not uh, mentioned that. We could call because uh, there is a reason that uh, we have uh, every. Uh, every I think I guess we have our own problems as, as everyone. And the, the, the intensity of the labeling is not so good that we a very, very good uh, measurement of the, of the, of the size. And uh, we will replicate this as well as we talk. In the second regards, the, the uh, exercise in the, the training, it could be the same effect if you put the mice in the running weights. Environment. Uh, no, no, playing okay. instead of forcing them to. No, the, the environmental enrichment is a very good uh, uh, body that, in fact, that we are uh, using a lot of uh, environmental enrichment. And it's even more, uh, it's, it's even better for the animals in, the, in, in terms of the positive action, better than the exercise. The problem is that, they, uh, on the contrary, that uh, in the human beings, we cannot store cognitive activity from the because you cannot take, uh, you cannot <laughs> take the mice within a hook or something. Uh, but uh, so, if you have the animals with uh, an environmental approach and you have a mixed effect of cognitive uh, activity plus the exercise, so you you cannot uh, you cannot analyze only cognitive action, but you can analyze only uh, exercise of physical activity. Thank you. Thank you. So, our next speaker <coughs> is Dr. Heather Hammond from uh, NIMH. Uh, Heather actually has been at NIH for quite a while. She first started out as a postdoc at NINDS in Ron McKay's lab and has been an independent investigator at NIH since 2001, and she's currently chief of units of All right, so I'd like to um, thank the organizers for putting together this really great symposium and for inviting me to speak it. Um, so I think we've already been introduced to adult neurogenesis in, I think, um, all three of the previous talks. Um, so I'll just run through uh, my introduction really quickly. So there are new neurons born in large numbers um, throughout adulthood in the hippocampus and in the olfactory bulb. And uh, in my group, we're particularly interested in the neuron in the organ of the campus. Um, and this, this just shows um, what these cells look like. So this is the dentate gyrus, this is the granule cell layer uh, shown here with the, gran the mature granule cells in blue. They're very tightly packed, very tiny cells, so you can't make out individual cells, um, except there are individual, some individual cells that are in red. And the, mature, the immature neurons, the young neurons, are labeled here um, in green. 
their cell bodies sit on the inner layer of the granular cell layer and on the inner edge of the granular cell layer, and um, their dendrites go out into the molecular layer, and you can see them um, a little bit bigger with you. So, um, as I started putting together this talk for this call symposium, I started to get a little nostalgic and think back to um, the days long ago when I used to spend a lot of time um, looking in a microscope um, trying to characterize uh, these newborn cells. Um, many, many, many newborn cells. And um, I felt a strong connection with Cajal, um, I think, doing that. Um, and we used to read a lot of Cajal. Um, <coughs> and at the time, we loved these cells, we thought the stain was great, but really they're not nearly as pretty as the neurons that people have been showing you. The labels we had back then, um, just were, they, they did the job, but they weren't that pretty. So this is um, treated in fine-bean autoradiography, these little things that look like pepper, um, grains of pepper or little pieces of dirt are the silver grains that show us that these are newborn cells. And then the brown stain is a neuronal stain that shows us um, that these are actually mature neurons. Um, and in this case, this is a regular glial cell here, also labeled with uh, training time. These are the cells that we now know are the stem cells. But it wasn't pretty, so it was really very exciting when, um, when uh, new techniques were developed and we were able to see that these cells, that these newborn neurons, actually had dendrites, still not as pretty as Golgi, but, but much better than this. Um, these cells have dendrites, and we could also see through an entire section, tissue section, so we could see that there are really quite a few of these cells. Um, whereas here, it looked, we could only see a tiny fraction, so it looked like this was a rare event. In fact, um, it's a very common event. And so I think this helps quite a bit in establishing um, that adult neurogenesis really does occur. So everybody now pretty much accepts that adult neurogenesis is occurring. But there's still quite a bit we don't know about it. Um, and one of the things we don't know is what these cells are actually doing. Why are they there? Why are they being born? So in order to look at this, um, several years ago we developed um, a line of transgenic mice um, and more recently we've developed transgenic rats. These are the mice that uh, Leo told you about earlier. Um, these are the mice, so they express herpes thymine kinase under the GFAT promoter, which means that these radial cells, which are the uh, stem cells for the new neurons born in the granular cell layer, these cells express um, uh, herpes TK. And when we, if we give the animals develop normally, but if we give an antiviral drug, valgancyclovir, any cell that expresses TK and attempts to divide will be killed. So the TK in our mice is also expressed in these mature astrocytes, but since they don't divide, they're not effective. Um, and this just shows that the astrocytes aren't effective. So this is a treated transgenic. You can see large numbers of astrocytes here expressing the TK, but still there. And when we count, we see that none are lost. The neurons, on the other hand, are completely wiped out by the treatment with the drug. So now we have a tool with which we can eliminate adult neurogenesis and ask um, what the effects are. So, um, of course, we, we're very interested in what the behavioral effects are, but we'd also like to know kind of what the circuit effects are. Do these cells have effects um, that throughout the hippocampus that go beyond just the young, the population of young brain cells themselves. So I said that, um, I showed this picture a minute ago and said that this demonstrated that there was really quite a bit of neurogenesis. But relative to the huge population of brain cells, um, this population of young neurons is really quite small. It's um, been estimated that over the course of a month, the number of new neurons that's generated represents about 5% of the total granular cell population. So it's not really clear that these would have a major effect um, in the hippocampus. So um, we, we as the Tim uh, Schoenfeld, who's a postdoc in the lab, has done these experiments. Um, so he took uh, our transgenic rats, gave them cyclovir, and uh, for four weeks, and asked what we see. 
So, and then used MRI to measure the, uh, the volume of these individual regions. So you can see here that after four weeks without neurogenesis, the dengue gyrus is actually smaller. So this was a fully developed animal. This was an adult with a fully uh, grown dente gyrus, and yet it shrunk when we stopped uh, producing new neurons. But we don't see any effects downstream in CA3. So the dente gyrus here um, projects to CA3, as shown in this next couple drawing, um, and CA3 projects to CA1. But we don't see any effects in these downstream areas. And when we look at the total hippocampal volume, uh, there's maybe a hint that something's going on, but nothing significant. But if we wait eight weeks and treat the animals for eight weeks, so there's no neurogenesis um, for that longer period of time, we still see a very similar change, loss of volume in the density. But now CA3 is shown as well. CA1 is, um, shows no effect. And we see that even if we wait up to 16 weeks, there's still no effect. Um, of losing new neurons in CA1. Um, and at eight weeks, as well as at 16 weeks, now we see an effect on the total hippocampal volume. So these new neurons, even though their number is relatively small compared to the rest of um, the neuronal populations in the dente, they have major effects that we can see with relatively low resolution um, MRI. Well, this is very high resolution for MRI, but MRI is not a very um, and it's, it's a gross measure of the structure. So we also uh, did some Golgi staining to look at uh, what might be producing these changes. And you can see that in the granule cells, um, the granule cell morphology is unchanged. So the mature granule cells that remain aren't affected by uh, the loss of new neurons, as far as we can see. In CA3, however, um, we see that the that the um, dendritic tree, the apical dendritic tree, is shrunk. And this happens only in the dorsal portion of the hippocampus and not in the ventral portion, um, which we don't exactly understand now because the volume changes in both regions and there is neurogenesis throughout the um, entire hippocampus. Um, but there's something special about the, um, the parental neurons here which uh, causes them to show this uh, dramatic shrinkage. So um, the new neurons really are having, um, having a major effect on, uh, on the structure throughout the hippocampus. And uh, next we wanted to know what their effect is on behavior. So one of the, probably the predominant idea for what new neurons might be doing um, is pattern separation. So uh, this is, I think, the first study um, from uh, Tim Bussey's group, the first study to show um, an effect on pattern separation without new neurons. And this is, so, this is their experiment. They had a radial arm maze, and they put animals in one of the arms, and then and, um, gave a reward, and then asked the animal to find the arm that had been to before. And they had different conditions. In some cases, the arms were very far apart from each other, and in some cases, the arms were very close to each other. So this shows so that they call this a high separation and a low separation. And they find that animals without neurogenesis um, are, behave just like the normal animals when there's a high separation, but they uh, don't do as well when the arms are closer together. And they made an analogy between um, this high versus low separation and an idea, a, really a computational idea, about what the dente gyrus is doing, which is that um, because the dentate has a huge number of granule cells, and very few of them are active at any given point, um, the idea is that the dentate, what the dentate might be doing is um, separating, uh, decreasing interference. So you can have a huge number of individual patterns that might store a huge number of memories without um, any interference. So uh, these guys said that this is probably a behavioral correlate of that pattern separation idea. And then um, this idea was really, really picked up, and now um, a lot of people think that this is probably a major function of the, of the dentate virus, of new neurons in the dentate. And it's described a few different ways. So in some cases, it's described as really a discrimination problem. So this animal without neurogenesis has trouble 
distinguishing between um, between locations uh, if they're very close together. This shows a more visual uh, representation, less spatial, so you might have trouble discriminating between these two flowers that are similar in color. But then because the hippocampus is um, thought to be involved in learning memory, there's often, but not always, a um, um, memory component added to the idea, which is that if you don't remember things very well, if you don't have a really, really good memory, then you might um, not be able to distinguish things that are similar. So if you have a vague memory, you might not remember whether you saw a can of Coke or this red and white, I think it's a pencil holder. It looks kind of similar. So um, this is the idea of pattern separation uh, and neurogenesis, which is really caught on there. This is only a fraction of the number of papers that have tried to link neurogenesis and pattern separation. Of course, there are also quite a few people who um, have pointed out that, well, there's no real reason to link this um, type of behavior, this difficult discrimination, with pattern separation as it's been described computationally. So people have argued that we should just call this discrimination. But whether we call it uh, discrimination behavior or trouble with pattern separation behavior, um, it still doesn't encompass all of the effects uh, that we see, all of the, uh, the entire role of new neurons. Um, because there are other findings, um, this is an example from my lab, where we see behavioral changes that really are, don't seem to have anything to do with discrimination. So in this case, these were mice that were put into a novelty stress feeding task. This is a task where you put animals into a novel, into a large box in a novel environment, put food in the center, and you ask how long it takes for the animal to overcome his anxiety about eating in a novel environment and begin to eat the food. For swim is a test where you put an animal in a big pool of water, and you ask how long it takes for him to stop trying to escape and just um, keep himself floating. Um, but the important thing here about both of these tasks is that they're one trial tasks. So these are, this is the first time the animals have been in either of these tasks. There's nothing to, for them to have learned to remember that it should change their behavior. Um, they're also, um, so they're one, they're one trial tasks and there are no cues. So there are no similar cues. There's nothing to discriminate to help them um, with, in either of these cases. So how do we fit this together? How does this, how do these changes on the discrimination behavior and these changes in anxiety and depressive life behavior fit together? Well, one possibility, one thing we've thought about is that both of these um, tests, all of these tests, contain a high degree of ambiguity or uncertainty. So in this case, it's specifically when the animals are really uncertain, when the task is very difficult, that they have trouble. And here, these animals are in a brand new situation and they really don't know what the optimal behavior is. So maybe the new neurons are really involved in behavior under uh, ambiguous conditions. So we decided to try and test this directly. And this is the work of Lucas Glover, who's a graduate student in the lab. Um, so to do this, we did uh, a fear conditioning task. So half of the animals went into this condition where they did reliable fear conditioning. So in this case, this is a standard cue fear conditioning paradigm. The animals hear three tones, and at the end of each tone, they receive a shock, a small shock. Um, then the other half of the animals uh, were trained in this ambiguous cue condition. So they received the three, same three tone shock patterns, but they also heard three additional tones that didn't end in a shock. So for them, only 50% of the tones predict a shock. And then uh, we tested them all by giving them six tones um, with no shots. So you can see that in the reliable cue condition, the animals without neurogenesis, the TK animals shown here in blue, behave perfectly normal. They freeze uh, in response to the tone. So this is baseline, this is before the tone comes on, this is the response to the tone. They all have uh, they've learned the association between the tone and the shot. In the ambiguous condition, however, we see, a, we see a difference. 
So the wild type animal screams just as much to the ambiguous cue as they as to the reliable cue, but the uh, animals without neurogenesis screams less. So that was what we had, pre we had predicted that we'd see a difference in this ambiguous condition, but we actually thought they'd freeze more. And one of the problems with freezing less is that this could just be a learning effect. What if the animals without neurogenesis just didn't learn this association? We don't think that's the case because they're learning perfectly well here and because they show good evidence of learning. They're freezing significantly more in response to the tone than they did before the tone came on. So it does suggest that they learn about the tone, but it's very difficult to say whether, well, maybe they didn't just didn't learn it quite as well. So uh, to look at this, we did another test, um, which didn't involve learning. So in this case, um, the animals don't need to know anything about the tone and uh, tone shock theory in order to, um, nothing, nothing that they've learned about the tone will help them. So we do the same um, reliable and ambiguous uh, condition here. But then we put the animals in a completely new environment. We put them in an novel stress feeding task um, with no tones and no shocks and ask how they behave. And here we see that the animals without neurogenesis uh, now show more anxiety-like behavior than the wild types. Um, whereas the, if they've been trained in an ambiguous condition, I should say this is two days, so this testing is two days after the end um, of uh, the, the period has been trained. Um, so animals that were trained with the ambiguous cue, um, now the animals without neurogenesis now show less anxiety. So they're showing less anxiety here, just like they did here. So that makes us feel good that at least we can see this low decreased anxiety um, effect twice. Um, so, but you can see that the flip that we see here with more anxiety in one case and less in the other case is really caused by a change in the wild types. So the normal animals are behaving very unafraid if they experience this reliable shock. In the case, in fact, these animals show no more anxiety than they would have if they'd never been shocked. And yet, if they received an, um, if they had ambiguous cue training, now the wild types, the normal animals, show quite a bit of anxiety. Um, so, whereas the uh, animals without neurogenesis are really not taking advantage of this information, they don't change their behavior, they don't adapt their behavior uh, according to whether they experienced a predictable or unpredictable shell. So, I think one way to think about this might be that the new neurons are actually a system that helps us know how to behave. So, um, so of course, this was developed by Homeland Security to tell us, you know, after a terrible event has occurred, how should we behave, you know, in the coming days? So, maybe the new neurons are doing something similar. So, if something bad happens, but it's entirely predictable, you really don't need to change your behavior. You can go about your business, and only if you see those predictive cues or hear those predictive cues do you need to be afraid. But if something bad happens and it was entirely unpredictable, you need to be very, very cautious. So the animals without neurogenesis seem to be stuck here at code yellow. They, they don't take advantage of, they don't change their behavior according to predictability, and in fact end up probably being overly cautious in many cases and underly cautious in, in some other instances. Um, so the new neurons perhaps um, are there to help us adapt to, um, adapt to environments that we haven't yet experienced using information that we've learned previously, and specifically learned using um, something about the predictability. So it seems to be very important in, in um, negative and aversive conditions. But we've also wondered whether the neurons um, might also be useful in positive um, learning. So a lot of what we've been studying is about stress. The hippocampus is known to be very involved, very important for stress. So it could be that the new neurons, that their entire role is really focused on um, adapting to negative experience. 
Um, but we decided to put the animals into reward-based learning where there's, it's very unstressful. Um, there's no, there are no threats here. Um, this is just animals pressing a lever to get a reward. And this is the work of Rosemary Kelsey, who's a postdoc in the lab. So in this test, um, mice, we've done it with mice and with rats, and we see the same results with both, which always makes us feel good. Um, the animals press, press a lever and get a reward. And here they press a lever once. Every time they press a lever, they get a reward. Here they press three times for every reward. Here they press five times for every reward. And you can see that the animals without neurogenesis um, behave the same as the normals for both the mice and the rats. So they learn this task just fine. This is a very easy task, um, and uh, they really have no trouble. But over here, we test their motivation by using a progressive ratio. So in this test, which I've sort of shown over here, every time they press, they press the lever and get a reward, the next time they have to press the lever more times to get the reward. And it uh, increases exponentially like this. So you can see here, both the mice and the rats without neurogenesis give up faster. They stop pressing um, earlier than the wild type animals. And so in both cases, I think it's interesting that it's both around the same breakpoint. Um, they go from about 15 rewards to about 13, which um, it's only a difference of two rewards, but it turns out to be a difference of about 170 level presses. So the wild types are really pressing, they're really much more motivated um, to get these rewards. So in fact, neurogenesis is not just important for negative and threatening conditions, it's also important for positive conditions. And I think we haven't done any experiments to test this yet, but I think this also could potentially tie into the ambiguity um, to the idea about new neurons being important for ambiguity. Because here it's very clear. The animals can learn very quickly um, exactly what they have to do. Here you have to press five times and you'll get your reward. Here it's very difficult to learn. So the animals are tested on three successive days, but because the number of lever presses is always changing, they probably can't predict how many presses they need to do. So it's in an in, in ambiguous condition. Uh, so we still have a lot of work, of work to do to figure out what the new neurons, the, all of the functions of new neurons, and how they're all related. Um, but I think ambiguity might be a good start. So with that, I'd just like to thank the people in my lab. So Rosie um, did the reward uh, behavior I showed you, Tim did the um, volumetric studies that I talked about, and Lucas did the uh, two fear conditioning studies. Um, Jason and Amelie did the work that I alluded to on NSF and the forced swim um, with the mice earlier. Um, Alan Goretzky's group helped us with the MRI, and David Bannon in Oxford is a collaborator, um, and also Lucas's co-mentor um, for the fear conditioning studies. Stop there. That's the, that's the million dollar question. Um, and I have no idea why you would need new cells as opposed to just synaptic plasticity. One idea we're thinking about is you know, with this dramatic adaptation, if, if the new cells are helping you adapt to a new environment, environments change drastically. And maybe you know, if you have cells, if you have a system that's set up to make you very cautious, maybe the best way to stop being very cautious and start going out and foraging is to just get rid of those things. But, but yeah, why couldn't you do it just with synapses? I don't really know. Um, I do think that what's special about the granular cells in the hippocampus, the granular cells in the olfactory ball, is just that they're huge populations. So we used to think that whatever it is that makes them need to be huge populations means that being bigger, getting bigger and bigger and bigger 
<coughs> so that would fit with the pattern separation idea. If you can separate the patterns better by having a huge population, then it's probably best to you know, make it continually bigger. But I also think that it's possible that having a huge population just makes it easier for us to detect these cells. I actually think that there are new neurons being born elsewhere. Certainly not all populations, but I think there are certain um, small interneurons being born throughout the brain. They're just very difficult to see because given the same turnover rate, you produce a smaller number of neurons. I like very much you know, talk, um, many questions, but I will ask only two. So first one is then uh, the significant increase in the people then they give the COVID. So it's just after only four weeks. So the, re the reduction in uh, the reduction, the decrease in the in the number of newborn neurons makes uh, a strong decrease in just four weeks. So how how what about the the number, the total number of mature running neurons? Are you yeah, it's a great question. So um, he asked uh, when the um, we see the, the dentate gyrus shrinks after four weeks when we stop neurogenesis. Um, and what's the what's the total number? Is that because you're losing total number of neurons? Is that um, so? It's a great question. We don't actually know. And I was thinking about as I was putting this together um, that if the dent if the if the granulurons themselves, if the mature granulurons aren't shrinking themselves, if the morphology is the same, and yet we see the total volume shrinking, I mean, it could be something like, well, we, we know we don't lose astrocytes, but perhaps the astrocytes are shrinking or other glia are shrinking. We don't really know. But, but yeah, maybe the most obvious way to get the volume shrinkage is to shrink the total number of cells, and we don't actually know. Second quick question in the fear conditioning study. Uh, it resembles a lot for me uh, the, the typical pattern of non-continuous learning. So it, it takes longer for the animals right. to learn the same. So this is a question of time. Or, so if the, if the TP uh, animals would have longer time to learn, would, oh, they, would, the they, would they catch up? So um, it's a great question. So the question was, um, the, our ambiguous cue condition where we were um, cues either predictive tone or uh, the tones either predict a shock or don't predict a shock. This is like discontinuous learning, which takes longer to learn. Um, so I don't, we don't know. We only, so we started training for one day and found that we didn't really get real robust um, effect. They didn't, it took longer than a day to learn. So most people, when they do, if you're just doing reliable cue conditioning, one tone shock pairing is generally enough. Um, sometimes people do two or three. We ended up doing this over a few days, so they got nine tone shock pairings. Um, I think that's probably, <coughs> excuse me, I think that's probably enough, but we don't actually know. It's tough in our tests. One thing that's I mean, interesting but also difficult in our tests is we don't know what the optimal behavior is. So it's tough for us to ask about learning because there was no, there, you can't discriminate between the tones of the shock and don't. They're exactly the same. So you don't know, you don't know who's behaving properly. Yes. yes. So, so along those lines, I have a couple of questions. First of all, how long is a new neuron a new neuron? And then secondly, how do you discriminate between the effect of it being a new neuron causing these effects? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So, um, a new neuron is new for, so these neurons take at least two weeks to become mature and, and think functional. Um, they seem to have, at least in slices, they have um, different, they have stronger um, potentiation. LTP is um, greater for, I think, a period of from four weeks to six weeks of, of age. Um, but then after that, nobody really knows whether these neurons become exactly like the neuron point in development <laughs> or whether they remain different in some way. We also don't know when behaviorally they, um, they're most functional. So it's something that we're really interested in. Part of the problem is, if you have a task that takes several days or several weeks to learn, 
you're yeah. learning it over the period where you know the cells might start out being a week old and then they end up being two weeks old. So it's very difficult. Um, we now have a test that's a one-day test where we're seeing differences. And so we're starting to use that to see, to ask when the neurons are functional. And we see that um, we see that we don't see effects in that behavior task until the cells are born into it. But one problem with our um, model is that it's not reversible. Once we've wiped out the neurons, they don't come back. So we can't ask, we can't ask um, what the end point is basically when the neurons are um, so it's People know that in addition to being a brilliant scientist, Ramani Kahala was also an accomplished artist. So it's not necessarily surprising that in addition to inspiring scientists, he also has inspired artists. And this section uh, is an attempt to delve into that. It involves two artists, um, both of whom are presently exhibiting work in the building. Um, they're very different artists. They have different styles. They express their art in generally different media. But they've both been substantially influenced by uh, the money Kahal. And I think it's interesting they, they've also been influenced by Kahal in different ways. Um, so uh, this is this is definitely kind of a different tact to take in the middle of the scientific symposium. I hope you enjoyed it. The first the first uh, of our two speakers is John Hunter, who uh, was born in Missouri, and people get more detail about that. <laughs> Got her Bachelor's of Fine Arts at the Kansas City Art Institute, a Master of Fine Arts at UC Davis. Um, and shortly after that, um, was actually the first um, woman to win a very prestigious Fellowship, an artist in residence fellowship um, at the Royal Academy of Art. And uh, she then went on to, be, uh, um, to go to the University of South Carolina, where she's now uh, an associate professor and head of foundations in the School of Visual Art and Design. And um, both of these artists have extensive uh, experience um, presenting and talking about their work uh, and showing their work. Variety of <coughs> exhibitions. Um, John's work, I think, is very interesting. I think you'll see how heavily influenced it is by the Thank you. Um, thank you for being here, and I am very glad that I'm here. And thank you for inviting me and organizing this. Any day I talk about the hall is a good day, even today at the night, is a great day for me. When I go to parties at, at home, I have to sort of be careful because I can get carried away in talking about the hall. So whenever I go to parties, I have to remind myself you can only say three things about the hall to three different people, and then that's it. And one of the reasons why I'm telling you this is I have a lecture plan. And so it's going to end one or two ways. Um, either I will wrap it up very succinctly and eloquently and um, have something very nice to say as a conclusion, or I'll realize I've run out of time and I'm just going to stop. So, um, my, um, the main core of my talk is really the um, relationship among Don Quixote, Cajal, and um, Francisco Goya. And so, um, and this is a drawing of Picasso's of um, Don Quixote. And we'll get to uh, the core of how they really visually 
And I'm really interested in how Don Quixote and the legacy of the novel Don Quixote, which is really the first modern novel, influenced um, the development of art um, through the golden age of Spain, but how it really trickled down into modern art and how Cajal envisioned himself in how he was able to sort of perceive things. This is the first time I um, met Carl, and it was in the spring of 2012. And I was reading a, an article on the classroom um, published by Christoph Pope. And so I spent a lot of time um, Googling, because I'm an artist. And so I'm like going back and forth at the different terminology. And within the um, visual cache that came up were images of Cajal's. And I was immediately struck and um, enamored with his work. And a few years ago at the University of South Carolina, a prominent um, ceramics collector came to our um, school to talk about her collection and what she looked for in ceramics and different qualities. And Cajal's work to me exhibited exquisite line quality in how rooted it was in perception. And he, his line quality is defining space, it's defining what's in front of it, what's happening between forms, and then also the shape of the lines, which are actual lines. And a lot of times in art, when we talk about actual lines, we're thinking about how <clears throat> contours move across the body, around the body, and how they define. Um, something physically you're perceiving, but because he's using stain, his lines are actual, actual lines. And that to me was quite fascinating. And also in the cache <clears throat> were images of Golgi's, which were not as interesting to me. And that's because even though his lines are very elegant and very beautiful, there was a certain mannerism to the lines. And it felt to me that he was observing nature and drawing nature in a particular way to support an idea that he had about it. And there's also around the edges of the page even, he has sort of a slight border. And so he's creating a container where with Cajal, you have continual space. He's completely given himself over to nature and the perception of nature. And he's showing you something that he's perceiving and understanding through um, the act of drawing. And so nature is sort of bigger than himself and he's sort of sharing that perception. And he was able to have a lot of confidence in his perceptions. There's a famous canon story that gets told of people about Kamal, which is a really funny anecdotal story. But at the same time, he was in prison shortly after that. And that was psychologically and emotionally sort of a grim period. And while he was in, um, Imprisoned, and he's laying on this hand straw and watching the bugs um, crawl around. He notices light filtering in a particular way, and it was reflecting what was happening outside, inside. And so he thought for a while that he had discovered the camera obscura. And then he realized after he was released, he didn't discover the camera obscura, it already existed. But from that experience, he had a tremendous amount of confidence within his own perception and with his own ability to recognize important ideas and then to talk about those ideas. His grandfather was a weaver, and when Cajal was a toddler, he spent a lot of time in his grandfather's studio assisting him. And so from a very early age, fundamentally, he understood how things were created from separate threads and within a loom and with paddles of a loom and how things moving back and forth in space and things moving up and down. So you have something that becomes internalized and then becomes an intrinsic part of his perception and how he created and formatted his work and understood what he was seeing as in separate parts, creating a unified whole. This is the first drawing I drew of Cajal's. And the first time I saw his work in person was this past spring on the exhibit upstairs. And everything I'd seen of his work up until that point had been secondhand. And when you see work secondhand compared to when you see it in person, a lot of times it's a completely different experience. And Hall's work was so much more refined than I anticipated. And I was completely struck and inspired, and so I ripped out of my sketchbook a piece of paper because I just had to draw it because I was so impressed by his drawings. And so then I began drawing, and I was like, 
Oh, wow. I've really taken a lot for granted in how these are put together. Because there's a way in which you create drawings, and a way in which, which has to do with mapping out different parts and changing and racing and developing it and finding the form. And what I noticed immediately when I was drawing this drawing is that he drew it with a continuous line of ink. And he didn't map it out with pencil beforehand. And then he drew another continuous line. And, and so then I'm like, okay, well, if he did it, I'm going to do it too. And so then I went from the right to the left. And so I'm drawing this without erasing <clears throat> with a pen. And you can sort of see my proportion is off. And so then I'm wondering, well, how is he drawing these? And he's keeping them within proportion. How is this even happening? And so then the second time I drew it, I decided to create anchor points because I, I sort of thought, well, he probably drew the drawing several times before he came to a final conclusion, and maybe he drew a drawing or his final drawing. So that's one possibility. But even with that as a possibility, how is he achieving the proportions? And so the second time I drew it, I created these anchor points of the cells that are the really dark ones as you go through. You can sort of see my drawing now is in more proportion, and from there I drew the continuous lines around it. And again, this is the sort of drawing of body racing because that is what he did with those drawings. But he doesn't draw every drawing with that attitude. It's only when he's trying to demonstrate and reveal something that's intrinsic in how nature is formed and made. And when he's doing a drawing to illustrate an idea, then those drawings are the ones that typically are drawn first with a pencil and then knocked out later. And so that to me was very interesting. And it also indicated to me the whole of the personal integrity and dedication that we had. Also, around the time when I first heard um, about Pommel's work, I was invited by Dr. Dumont to do some illustration for his dedication of community. And when we started working together, I realized that scientists and artists communicate pretty differently. And the first three months, it was sort of interesting because he had asked me to do a certain thing in the drawings. And so I would think I would understand it. And so often what I would turn into was maybe not really what he wanted at all. And then we realized three weeks into it that some words within this field the same word would be something different in my view. And so then that was a very interesting point in realizing how to communicate. And then after that, I started doing some things wrong on purpose, every once in a while for fun. And, and I was learning, continuing to learn about the hall. And I started reading his um, science fiction stories. And it mainly because I, did, I felt a little bit too intimidated to read in my science because I'm an artist. And his vacation stories, I thought were hilarious. I thought there's a lot of sublimation that was going on in them. And I also thought it was a lot of bacteria that he selected this really fun. And so I began to see Kahal as someone who had a great sense of humor. And so for a long time, I thought I was going to do some sort of creative project based on his science fiction stories. And then I read his biography. And I understood him on a deeper level and I wanted to do a project that explored and examined his emotions and his feelings um, in a very biographical manner. And this is a sketchbook that um, I'm continually working on this project and something and I thought, you know, a big centerpiece of, you know, if he was pretty sorry, was really the struggle that he had in his relationship with his father. And how important his father was. Um, because it seemed like in the narrative, you know, he's struggling with his father. But then there's this kind of bonding that happens when Paul starts illustrating the man and his father is a really a level of approval, and that seemed to be a little meaningful for Paul. And in his book, he also begins it where he appears in the world of the first time. 
they do, they do too. And I immediately laughed after doing that sentence because I thought, you know, I just have this vision of Persephone, the goddess of springtime, sort of bringing him into the world. And so I thought, well, let's sort of start there and let's sort of incorporate this humor that I sort of see in the hall. And I thought, well, let's, let's back up even further. Let's think about before we get to Persephone conception. And then I'm appropriating some of the and Venus as well as into the Venus neurons. And this is Persephone sort of ushering into the world. And his explorations as a um, young boy was very interesting to me too. And he talks a lot of time about the and I so was sort of thinking about the psychological impact of exploring different types of architectural spaces and landscapes and how um, that was an integrated part of his identity. And then the one thing I really wanted to capture as well was just really sort of, there's a tremendous sense of loneliness that he felt. And because he was sent away from boarding school and so he didn't feel fully integrated with his family. And he also felt a little bit displaced because he got in trouble by it. And so, I had this image of sort of like a young desperado. And um, that sort of um, appears in his new image that it's really a lot. And he's sort of thinking about him. And okay, now I'm going to do this a little bit. I'm going to talk about how all of this is very developing. And so, um, regionally, there are all this woman is John Cartini is a very popular style. And, um, and what we have here with this painting is you can sort of see it's based on perception, but it's based on an idea. It's not, it's a constructed situation about something, about types of work that really take place, but it's not necessarily a real situation. And you can sort of see but these are different drawings that have been done separately that are now put together in such a way And even though this looks realistic, the edges and the way things are handled don't really articulate sort of if you were to walk in and just sort of see that situation. Like the forms are more, even though it's specific and it's done well, they're more generalized. And the reason why I wanted to talk about that is with Paul's work, in comparison to popular styles from that genre that I have been concerned to be a very general shaping of a tree. It's well crafted, and it becomes a lot about the craft. Where when we get to Paul, you have a variation in the only direction, you have a variation in material pressure, you have variation in surface. And you can sort of see here that the hand is able to try to do something about that. You can sort of see here that he's strong and he's doing some things that are addressing the issues of the environment. And I teach foundations, which is sort of the beginning to draw and the beginning to be designed and the beginning to color and the first is self And one of the things I have to be doing is perceptual drawing. And what you can tell from perceptual drawing is what intrinsically is going on inside of people. And you can sort of see intrinsically what they're going to want to be doing with their work. And you can sort of see intrinsically based on how they directions. And you have all kinds of different directions happening in people's work. You can sort of see these are intrinsically interested in um, to edit this one out, sorry. Um, interested in um, perception. And this this painting could this one really could be because I haven't been as advanced, but it really could be sort of like the American economic painting that occurs like a hundred years later. Okay. So um, with Kaufman and uh, Goya and Picasso, one of the things that they really uh, Mark to me is sort of they, they all sort of stand for a certain level of departure. And each of them seem to be interested in, I don't want to say truth because they're more interested in truthfulness. Where um, Goya is interested in being truthful 
things about society and culture. Picasso's making me interested in the truthfulness about design and planning, and Hoffman was very interested in the truthfulness about nature. And so their marks, you can sort of see what they have in common is their marks seem to be rooted in a type of perception and a type of expression that they have in common, sort of an idea of truthfulness. And I thought about just going back to as far as Goya, you know, to the and I thought, well, you can't really go start with Goya, but it really has to be with Don Quixote. And Don Quixote, um, the novel follows a character who has gone mad after reading several romance novels, and at the age of the he puts on old, old armor and goes out in quest of several of rules and battles. And, to romantic love. But within the, the novel, too, is um, the individual. It becomes the importance of the individual and the individual being their own subjectivity. And then the individual also being with themselves in a critical perspective. And so that ends up being sort of a key and what makes the center on the focus of art. And one of the reasons why it becomes so important to art in the um, of modern art is artists then begin to integrate themselves in the personal identity and their own subjectivity as part of the content of the work. It's no longer just the content of a narrative of the political figure or the figure. And now the artist is also part of the subject. And I'm doing the portrait of the portrait of the right. And if ever you have an opportunity to see the person, it can be a great thing to be afraid about the opinion of the state. It's a political issue. And you know, how can you feel So much of what's around it is shaking that we're actually seeing. We don't see what's around it. And he was very political and subversive, even, and risky in his subversiveness, even when um, he served at four, four different Spanish rulers. And this particular page is really a period. And you can see he is um, basing the composition on Velasquez. But he is making fun of this royal family. And you can sort of see there's a difference where he's separating himself from the back. Like the canvas is in front, so there's a separation between the artist and the family. And when she looks like she's won the lottery. And this person isn't even looking in front. And so they all are sort of together, but not together. And there's a disconnection and not really a purpose. And you can sort of see here by contrast, Velasquez. You know, he's part of the situation. He's part of the content. He's not separating himself, and he's highlighted himself. So he's integrated. Where Goya, he's in it, and he's kind of hiding in the background. He's kind of filled in. He's not really part of them. And so this becomes sort of a risky political statement. This is, um, I like to think of Goya's um, paintings of like the Kardashians. And so this is almost like, <laughs> Commentary, and you can sort of see where, you know, in the letter to the young, where, you know, she has her dog and she's very preoccupied with this. And, you know, her maid has an umbrella over her, but yet there's tremendous suffering in the background. And, this, and one of the things that um, Gloria did during his lifetime is he did travel to um, where the Spanish War of Independence occurred. And he was a, an 
an acquaintance of Agostina, and for those of you who may not know who she is, she brought apples to the Spanish army when they were battling the French, and the Spanish soldiers um, were sort of running away, they are beginning to feel defeated, and she runs up to the cannon, she lights it, and she starts firing it. And so then the guys who are running away, they're like, oh, okay, well, I guess we'll go back. And so then they go back and they start assisting her. And so he did not, Goya did not see the humor in things because he saw so much tragedy. And so you could sort of see where in Don Quixote there's a lot of humor with the battles and the duels and there's sort of a frivolousness that's occurring. Where Goya is really seeing sort of the tragedy of it. And he's not able to connect with um, the humor of it. And in his sketchbook drawings, he does lots and lots of drawings that were done around that he did it around these battle scenes. And he'll have occasions, I saw this. You know, and so he's basing this on his real experience and his subjectivity of um, the atrocities of war are sort of highly integrated. And this is one of the black paintings that was painted directly on the wall in his home. And these paintings have to be cut out of his home to be displayed. And it became important to paint directly on his wall because then after his death, they couldn't just be thrown away. They couldn't sort of be hidden. They were objects that had to be dealt with because they were within the structure. And so Cajal is as a young man, he's kind of between sort of those two worlds, where there's an influence of the realism of Goya, and you have the innate, like even when Cajal, you can sort of see with this figure, he's embracing a type of romanticism, and he's um, delving into romantic content, but he still has, you know, he can't really fight against who he is innately. He still is very involved in perception. And um, Constance Mayer, I'm just showing a couple of her paintings here because she's a figure that, uh, as you look through Cajal's drawings of his anatomy and his personal paintings, you can sort of see that he was very aware of art history and what other artists were making. And that trickles down into his personal photography as well. <laughs> And I have several slides of his anatomy drawings. Um, you can sort of see when he's setting up the, um, to study the anatomy of a figure, he's setting up the figure ex expressively. And he's, there's a reference to um, high art and, and drawings within these. And it sort of happens all the way through. It's not just a cadaver study, there's also expression. Okay, when Picasso was drawing Cubism, a lot of people talked about how that's how one really sees. And they talked about Cubism as a true expression of perception because you're seeing several planes at once. One of the reasons why I included this image of Cajal's is there's a lot of things that are sort of off about this figure in proportions, like face is too big, the belly button isn't really where it needs to be. I mean, there's something sort of that's off in the placement. But it did make me really think about um, the cubism. And it made me think about that philosophy of perceptual experience. And so I can sort of begin to see that philosophy in these works of Cajal's. Um, Picasso was an artist who um, made art about art. And that became a key part of his work. And his work is very studied of other artists, and he integrates that with him in his vocabulary. And you can see where Cajal influenced the um, decisions that Picasso made in this drawing from 1926, where there's a, um, ideas of how things are structured and designed that then Picasso is appropriating and integrating within his own work. And you can sort of see here where it's like the continuous line of the. Uh, and this is um, an artist who's considered an anarchist artist, and then Picasso is sort of integrating 
this artist within his vocabulary. In um, Kahal, in the shape of the drawings, and in the shape of this particular drawing, there is a sense of anarchy with it because you saw that early drawing, in the early landscape drawings, he's doing a format where he's framing it, and there becomes an um, a lack of convention in his approach to it that could be because he went through several sheets of paper and constructing them and said so they have to be economical with the paper. It can also be a statement of um, philosophy. And you can see where Picasso is very much influenced by um, these drawings and the compositions and they're influencing his um, approach to a subject matter that is mutually exclusive to a drawing of a cerebellum. And um, I'm going to end with um, these two paintings that I did of him and his life. And um, I find the hall inspiring and, um, and continually inspiring. And his level of thoughtfulness is what really inspires me the most in even his selection of mate because he wanted to pick somebody who was the exact opposite of his. And so he observed his wife in town before, for a long time before he actually courted her. And then she was escorting her uh, mother and her father had died. And he was looking at her personal qualities and her personal attributes. And he knew that in complementary contrast, it would either bring out the maximum vividness in each other or they would annihilate each other. So he knew it was going to be great or it's going to be terrible. And fortunately for him, it worked out really well. And he attributes her in his biography, he writes, you know, that he did not be all without her. And that she made, uh, created a world that made his uh, life and research um, possible. And so um, that level of thoughtfulness is just very interesting to me. And it is, it's quite beautiful. And so he, he just inspires me.
Okay, um, our next speaker, you may or may not come up and get her talk, is Rebecca Cannon, who uh, I think probably everybody is by now familiar with Rebecca's work around the building. Um, Rebecca is originally from Philadelphia um, and um, got her uh, bachelor's in art education from Penn State and then her master's in art education from the University of Illinois. And a master of fine arts and sculpture from the Rhode Island School of Economics. And for 35 years. <laughs> a professor of art at Northern Community College in now America. And her work over the years has been inspired by uh, a, a range of different kinds of science um, from uh, theology, chemistry, astrophysics, and uh, much years of First of all, it's just a huge honor to be here. Um, I just have so much gratitude for this opportunity. And as I was starting to think about what would be appropriate theme for my presentation today, one word came into my head, and that was waterfall. And some of you are aware of you know, my piece upstairs, that butterfly and soul. But I think if I would select one form that really, in my mind, really was a metaphor for my journey with um, all of the I'm also a huge fan of chaos um, So the notion of a butterfly effect seemed to be the perfect metaphor for describing my journey with um, all of the work. Just very briefly, um, I actually grew up wanting to be a scientist but I came into the world with an obstacle at the time, which was um, being dyslexic. But as I had grown, I've come to embrace this obstacle because it's provided an enormous uh, opportunity in new ways of seeing. And so a lot of the vision of the senior is the result of not reading books, but just being a curious person and someone who just sees relationships um, the physical phenomena of the butterfly effect, and Jeff assured me that most people would like to know that, but let me just repeat what it is, is a very interesting phenomenon. It, it says that a butterfly flapping its tiny wing um, in the southern hemisphere can impact weather in the northern hemisphere. When I thought about this, I thought, what an incredible metaphor in terms of my journey with Aha, because ever since I was introduced to his work, the impact of his writing and his vision has really impacted me on so many levels, not only my art practice, but my teaching practice, and really taking this notion of a bridge that I've been trying to build in my own career, bridging art and science to a new level. So through this um, um, presentation, you're going to see many of his quotes. This is probably one of his most famous ones. And again, it really uh, embraces this notion of butterflies at this point. This particular quote inspired this piece of sculpture, which is now on display here. And for me, really describes this um, genesis of modern growth zones. And what you see on the bottom is my interpretation, or this interpretation, for thinking. Um, this is a theory that, that purported that neurons were connected. So this is being described um, as a genetic, and it also looks like a new And then you start <clears throat> seeing these uh, little butterflies sort of climbing 
cannabis or animal cells is coming up in the same has been inspired by a whole signature around the world. And you can see that it's um, butterflies based on a very beautiful technique drawing themselves. But how did how did this what was the catalyst for this? The catalyst for this was the fact that I'm an invitation to come up that money and present the way. I had no idea who the group was. I had an email saying, if you come up that money, you can talk about your work. So there I am, I'm going to be in the room with a bunch of other people who are and sculpture and the art education person in me 
was just stunned at someone at eight years old who had that ability to go see and record. Um, and then as he gets older, you can see how the more uh, emotional part um, of his development is expressed through his art. I was also struck by his story, like Don as well, is how he would assist his father with these anatomical drawings. And again, that those seeds of, of being able to see and record at such a young age were so significant in terms of his development as a scientist. This was a big surprise to me, which I was totally unaware of, that Cajal had a great passion for stereographic photography. Now again, this is my opinion, I could be totally off base because I'm not trained in science, but I, I suspect that his ability and training looking through a stereographic camera really enabled him to be able to look under a microscope and see invisible things that weren't there. And when, when I was up in Madrid, we had an opportunity of looking at some goji uh, stains, which were really incredible because they were these little black dots. And when you looked at them under the microscope, they were like amber. They were just this magical form. And so I really believe that, you know, looking at histological uh, slides from that era that Cajal and Goji were working, his ability to see stereographically I really enabled him to see the depth of things that might not have been apparent to most other people. So when I came back from, you know, the, these two rich experiences, I went into my studio and it took me a good couple months to just sort of get my I don't know, my sea legs back. I mean, it was, I, I didn't even know where to begin. I mean, my head was swimming with all this neuroscience research. Most neuroscientists, they, they deal with one tiny small part of a big puzzle. I had the whole puzzle in my lap, and I needed to make some kind of sense out of it. So the first form that I found myself uh, gravitating to was the growth cone. And I was so excited yesterday when the drawings were unpacked to actually see that drawing which I had seen in Madrid and now in the United States. And this is my interpretation of growth cones. And Cajal wrote that it's a concentration of protoplasm of conical form endowed with an amoebic movement. So I wanted to create something that I felt in an artistic way really expressed that. I also wanted to use form and I wanted to use color to create the dynamicness that I understood about growth time. So that is how that piece came into being. Last summer I was invited up to the Marine Biological Lab in Woods Hole um, to present a lecture to a microscopy class. And I had been collaborating uh, on and off with another NIH uh, scientist Justin Taraska, who's in another building, who I met during that summer. And what we were have been experimenting with is I've been I built a three-dimensional model, or an interpretive model, I should say, um, of a growth cone. And it was so exciting because up at MBL, we actually experimented. What you're seeing now is projecting. Uh, microscopic data on this three-dimensional sculpture. And the idea was science is dynamic, but a lot of times it's um, difficult to express it in a very dynamic way. And so this is another view of it. And what you're seeing is the dimensionality of this sculpture and um, how the data was projected onto the surface. What was so exciting for me was my lecture was at the end of being in residence there for a couple of days. I got to present this as, as part of my experience of the Marine Biological Lab. Another piece um, that um, developed as a result of this experience uh, was a piece inspired by astrocytes and glial cells and, and by this actual Cajal um, drawing. And again, my interpretation uh, of my understanding of these cells. That, again, I'm not a neuroscientist, but one of the exciting things when artists and scientists get to work together, it, it enables both to view their work in new ways. And, and I, I'm hoping that my experience here was an opportunity for, for neuroscientists and scientists to have that experience as well. 
Now this quote um, is a quote that I felt really related to this particular piece, which is right across from the drawings. Um, the piece is called The Measure of All Things. And this particular quote of Cajal's talks about this notion of discovering intimate history of life. This is a piece that deals with um, diagramming the body using sacred geometry. And what you see here, these beautiful arches, um, is geometry that is used to map out the human body based on Greek sculpture. If you're also a musician, you know that this is, creates a harmonic. So there is this wonderful relationship between art, science, and music. And this particular piece talks about the relationship of water in the body and man's relationship to being stewards of water in the environment. So in this way, I really feel it deals with this notion of a perpetual duel with external forces. In this section, I just want to talk a little bit about um, a very unique opportunity that I have had. I have been doing simultaneous research in astrophysics up at Harvard Center for Astrophysics and NIH. And it gives me a really rare vantage point of being able to see that one of the things that really is a conduit between what you do as scientists, what we do as artists, and it doesn't matter what scientific field is, one word, patterns. And so I have been on a quest for about six years to use my work as a bridge between diverse scientific fields. And I'm very excited to share with you the last, the last part of my project is going to show you a project where I, I think I've hammered it. Wish I could get a Nobel Prize, but I don't think that ever did it. Um, but anyway, let's start where it begins. And as I'm looking at things in neuroscience and astrophysics, I'm starting to see, like, wait a minute, there's a relationship between these forms and it's in patterns at different scales. And that was an epiphany for me. So what you're seeing here are um, modeling of brain cells, and this is modeling of filaments um, out in the universe. And it's astonishing when you think about it that these two have a similarity, which is that they share a similar pattern. And it was really interesting as I started looking at Cajal quotes, you can see this notion of as long as the brain is a mystery, uh, the universe, and he talks about the reflection of the structure of the brain. So he really, you know, really planted that seed of possibility that this, this might be so. So one of my interests um, was, um, I noticed that in neuroscience, people um, really research proteins. But I was totally unaware that proteins fold like organic. So I thought, oh, this is really fascinating. There are four different ways they can fold. And so I started researching it. And um, like Dawn, I, I'm a Google image type of gal, and it's just fascinating to see what comes up. So what you see here on the left is what's called an energy landscape. And, and it is the mechanism or a visualization of how proteins fold. And in my worldview, I thought, wow, this is really interesting. It's so similar to black holes, which I've been intimately involved with for the last year. Um, and so what you see here, there are two different funnel forms that are that create some type of landscape that shift that shape shift form in some way. And that was the uh, inspiration for this particular piece called Energy Landscape, which is up on the second or third floor. And it's a piece that has been inspired by the relationship of protein folding, that dynamic, and the dynamic of black holes, both of which I am researching at the same time. So one day I get a phone call, and the phone call, uh, the person at the other end said, if you're willing to come up and do a lecture for my colleagues, I'll let you hold Einstein's spring. Who can turn that offer down? I mean, oh my god. So, I got off the phone. I said, absolutely. I, I would have done it for free, but well. So I got off the phone, and then I was wondering, how is that going to be delivered? How is that brain going to be delivered? 
what was histological slides. And so what you're seeing here is a histological slide of Einstein's brain. And as someone who's very passionate about astrophysics and neuroscience, as I'm looking at the unique features of his brain, and he had many unique features, I started wondering how the shape of his inner space, his brain, influenced his view of outer space. And that problem has been haunting me for about two years now. So many of you might not be aware that this is the International Year of Light, and it's also the centennial of Einstein's discovery of relativity. And what you're hearing now is not my stomach. I you know some of you might be thinking that you hear that noise. What you're hearing is the sound component for this installation called Portal, which has been inspired by uh, general relativity. It was uh, shown here at James Madison University and recently at the National Academy of Science for the centennial Einstein's discovery of relativity. And what we see here, these conical shapes represent the orbiting patterns of binary black holes. And the bottom is the outgoing wave, the result of this. What you're hearing is sonic data that is describing this as part of the sound component of this particular installation. These brown forms here are actual fossils that when you look at them in person, mimic the same shape of these cutouts, um, of these orbiting patterns. So what it does is it's creating um, a connection between geological time, which is the fossil, space-time, which is represented by these cones. And if, you, if, if you listen to this a little bit longer, you will actually hear a black hole that is being... It just got sucked in. Okay, that, yeah, so that's what a black hole sounds like. Now it's going to have the digestion. So... <laughs> Jeff Dunn came over to a reception at the National Academy of Science, and he made an extraordinary observation, which just I had to share with you. And I gave a little talk, and he raised his hand. He said, I'd like to share something. And he's, what he did was he equated um, a relationship between a growth cone, which we see here, a very beautiful visualization of that, with the growth cone that I created in relationship to the cone representing orbiting black holes. And I'm just going to read this very short quote. What, it, what he said is, one concerns the flow of mass and energy from the disordered universe, that would be the black hole, toward a single point. The other exemplifies the growth and infinite possibility of life. So it really just, you know, I loved how something that I have created, and Jeff and I dialoguing so much, really enabled him to draw a relationship between something he does and something I do. And, and to me, that's what has been so meaningful about my relationship with scientists. So I'm going to end my presentation today with a new project. You are the first people to see it. Um, I feel like it's having a mini premiere. Um, it's called Neurocantos. Uh, neuro, everyone knows what that is. Cantos from the word song. And I have to tell you, this has been such a thrill to work on because I feel like I have really satisfied my quest to draw, create a bridge between astrophysics and neuroscience. And this wonderful quote, which started our um, symposium today, I'm going to uh, come back to, because I was very fortunate to have an opportunity to actually look at some of these uh, 19th century glass plates at the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard. And when you look at these plates and, and you see how light has really captured um, something that we can't even see at a time when we really couldn't even see it is really pretty miraculous. And then this very beautiful microscopic image. Um, so these have been my two uses as I've worked on this project. 
Um, what you're seeing here now is an experience I had last February. I was invited to the um, Salzburg Global Symposium, um, which brought together people from all over the world to discuss the notion of the art of neuroscience, what is the source of innovation and creativity. Yo-Yo Ma was invited. I mean, it was an amazing group of humanity coming for five days and, and discussing this. During this experience, I met a British poet, and we have continued an ongoing dialogue about um, what our thoughts are about the mind and the brain. And what you're seeing here is these uh, a section of these ideas that I would send to him in email form, and then he would interpret it in prose. And by him interpreting something I was thinking about enabled me to understand what I was thinking and seeing in a very different way. So this is a series of prints that will be part of this exhibition. And this particular print um, merges ideas that have to do with astrophysics. I, and I'm just going to read a couple words because it's a little hard to read. Uh, it says, the word constellation keeps resonating. Its relationship seems to perfect. The notion of neuronal pathways as both conduit and catalyst for chemical and electrical firings, confirming both memory and narrative self, as long as connecting us deeply with others. So this poem and this segment, this fragment of a poem, um, was really the catalyst for um, a sculpture installation, which I've been working on probably for uh, about nine months. And you are going to be the first people to see it today. What I've done is it involves eight sculptural elements and a sound component. And the sound component is made up of spoken language. So you're going to hear Cajal quotes in English and in Spanish. And you're going to hear fragments of the poems. So this is what one of the sculpture elements looks like. This particular cone um, has been inspired by uh, the neuronal pathways. So this represents the brain. And then this form on the bottom, this sort of uh, circular form, represents um, the larger circle represents um, the patterns, um, uh, cosmic patterns, all the way down to uh, micro patterns, very similar patterns. And this particular quote really, for me, um, really summarized a lot of my experience working on this project, Cajal. Uh, and he starts talking about these um, images based on observation and ideas slumbering in the unconsciousness. And, and it was very interesting because I worked on this in a very deliberate way. And what you're seeing here, these are all hand cut out and painted. So this is very laborious work. And what I realized when I looked at this close up, it looked like the human eye. And it was so fascinating to me. It was like where I started my journey with the illumination piece with this one element. And, uh, and this particular, these, uh, they're fossil rocks, very beautiful. They also mimic very similar patterns. So fasten your seatbelts. Um, I want you to experience this sort of Las misteriosas mariposas del alma. Un día, el secreto de la vida mental. Fabricated from lasers, computer, and lens, seeing and analysis of seeing the world, a phenomenon that continues in the eyes to ripple out and have a resonance with human vessels. You see yourself in the process of the heart and the ability of the space of the existence, the mysterious butterflies of the sweat of the sun, whose beating of the wings may want to do to us the secrets of the mind. So imagine walking through eight of these and hearing this sound. The phrase is pregnant. Faith is happening at 4 a.m. this morning. The philosophy reminds us. Creating a kingdom and a new company development. 
a separate world which ain't invisible, made possible through mechanical technology and lens. If so, perhaps they might provide forms. So when I get these from my friends, I'm using the same concept. In consideration, my universal patterns throughout the patterns as a part of the server. As a present, and so it was words, phrases, practices. So, in, in terms of the sound artist that I collaborate with, her, her whole concept for this is because she says that words are so like bits of meaning that they float to the surface and manifest often in incomplete forms to our awareness. So, my whole idea of concept for this art installation is that you will have an opportunity to experience it both visually and through auditory. And it will also have one more component, which is um, a component that is based on what we call motion poetry. And there are three sections to this. So this exhibition will have sound, sculpture, it will also have video projections. And the center section of this is based on the Kahal quote, which again, circle back to the butterfly. And and just this whole phenomena how these elegant shapes change and they morph and they become something new and different to everyone who perceives them. But can you imagine being 10 years old and having this experience walking through this as a child and just experiencing it? I've always tried to create a similar awe and wonder to our to what I remember about science when I was a young girl. So it's part of what I've tried to do in my art practice is to use my artwork as a way of really reimagining science. And And I can't think of a more appropriate quote to end my talk today. Um, any man could be so determined to sculptor of his own brain. You don't have to be a sculptor to sculptor and brain. I'm starting to realize. And I really want to conclude where I began with the butterfly effect. And I want to use it as a metaphor for what's possible when an artist and neuroscientist work together to create new bridges between art history and neuroscience and a very special thanks to Juan de Carlos and to Jeff Diamond and to the research institutes that they represent for the continued support of my work. Thank you very, very much. So we, we need to stop for lunch now, but Rebecca's going to be around if you have uh, questions for her afterwards. We're going to um, meet back here at uh, at 1.40, I think, for the next session. We have two great scientific sessions this afternoon, so please come back. Thanks.